The character of Colleen Kerrigan struggles daily with her alcohol addiction, something that's mirrored in the life of her creator, author Lauren B. Davis. And here now to tell us how fiction can sometimes get to the truth more easily than a memoir, Lauren B. Davis, author of The Empty Room, and we're very happy to have you here at TVO with us tonight. Lovely to be here. Thank well, you. Well, let's start there. You've written a novel as I opposed have to a memoir. I have written a novel. And the first thing I have to take exception with, yes. since we started up here, is that <laughs> Colleen struggles. I don't struggle. You don't struggle I any. Do not struggle. Can I say you don't struggle anymore? You certainly can't. You know, I have a friend of mine who said, she came over for lunch one day, and I said to her, would you like a glass of wine with lunch? Because we were living in France at the time. And she said, I could never have a drink around you. And I said, why not? And she said, because it must be such a struggle for you not to drink. I said, oh my God, if it was that much of a struggle, I'd be drinking. <laughs> and the truth is, it's not. I mean, the, the compulsion to, to drink has, was lifted years and years ago, and I don't, I don't feel the need, I don't feel the desire. It doesn't bother me, I can be around alcohol, I'm good. So I don't struggle. That's part of the great gift. Well, just for the record, this, water we, is good. Both water in yeah. both of our glasses yeah, excellent. here. Not a shot of vodka. No, <laughs> no, I don't need it, and I don't think you want it. So thank there you we very go. much. That's it. And it's been how? It's been a long time now, 18 right? Years. 18, Over years. Eighteen years. Yeah. Do you remember the date? I do. Of course, I do. March twenty-first, first day of spring, nineteen ninety-five. Was there significance to the first day of spring? Well, I don't think there was consciously, but I think it's a lovely metaphor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, having. Um, clarified the introduction to this <laughs> conversation. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about why you decided to do this in novel form as opposed sure. to memoir? Well, I think, you know, novels and memoirs have very different narrative arcs. And, you know, with a memoir, it's all about how the events contained in the memoir contributed to the memoirs becoming who he or she became, mm -hmm. right? That, those, those specific events, right? It's not the story of a life, it's those specific events. And novel, fictional characters are much more involved in transformation, which is not to say there isn't transformation in memoir. There sometimes is. But you come at it from a different place. And you have, I think, more objectivity when you're working in fiction. Um, you know, often uh, with writers that I'm teaching, emerging writers that I'm teaching, you know, I'll say, you know, that, that character, that section, that's not working. And they'll say, but that's what happened. That, that's exactly what happened in real life. And I say, well, I'm sorry, but it doesn't have the dramatic impact. It doesn't have the narrative arc you need. And so sometimes you have to be able to get away, I think, from the facts, if you will, to get at the truth. And fiction lets you do that. And fiction lets you do that. And one of the stories I love to tell is that, you know, you know how everybody talks about the 1936 World Olympics. And Hitler, in Berlin. In Berlin. And Hitler refused to, to uh, shake Jesse, to Owens, shake Jesse hands. Owens' hand. Well, apparently that never happened. Right? <laughs> it's a great story. And, and Jesse Owens now, in fact, well, it, later in life, it, admitted that that never happened. What apparently had happened is that Hitler's uh, handlers the day before, when another black American athlete had won an award, I can't remember what his name was, forgive me, um, and Hitler had to leave because he had other things to do. He was a very busy man, after all. And so there was a bit of a hue and cry over this. And his handler said, you know, look, you can't do this. You've either got to go to everything or nothing. And he said, OK, I'm going to nothing, because I can't go to everything. And that's and so, why. And that was why he didn't shake Jesse Owens' hand. Now, those are the facts. They, they but actually that tell the truth. I was just going to say, it's actually less indicative exactly. of what the guy really was Precisely. all about. Right. So we're better to go with the fiction than the facts? I am. You are. <laughs> I am. You know, I think, I I, I think for me, that's, that's the world I, I work in. That's the way things make sense to me. You know, Joan Didion, who, of course, doesn't write fiction much, uh, more known for nonfiction, she talks about how if she had access to her own mind, she wouldn't write. And she <laughs> writes to find out what she thinks about things. And, <laughs> and that's pretty much what I do with fiction, is <laughs> I take something that's bugging me, something that's obsessing me, some question that I have that I can't figure out the answer to, and I start playing with the what ifs and what kind of a person and what would happen when. And the next thing you know, a character begins to form and that character begins to have a story. And those stories take me places that I think I've probably been composting in my subconscious for a long time. Composting. And out, come, and out, comes, and out comes the story. Let me follow up on something you said a while yeah. ago, though, about being more objective when you, when you work in fiction as opposed right. to fact. I would have thought it was the other way around because the threat of a lawsuit really does force you to be very objective about the people you're writing about, doesn't it? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I've never, I've never written memoir, and I, you know, I don't really write. I write blogs, but I don't really write nonfiction. I think, you know, there are people um, in my novels who are who are based loosely, inspired by, mm. really inspired by people I've known in my life. What's interesting is that those people never recognize themselves. Hmm. And I think that, again, goes back to this composting process. Mm. When, when an author takes someone they know and, for fictional reasons, allows them to sort of live in the subconscious, by the time that comes back out onto the page, that person really isn't the human, the real living human being anymore. They are then this creation. Oh, the Somerset mom said, you know, novelists aren't God. We don't create mm -hmm. out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, so we always bring into it a little bit of what we've seen, a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person. Let me ask you about the composting, though. Yeah. You, this book, I gather, has been composting in some respects for 18 years now, Probably right? Probably has been. So you couldn't, I'm inferring then, that you could not have written this book 18 years ago. Well, I wasn't drawn to write it 18 years ago. I mean, I think when I was in early sobriety, I did write a collection of short stories called Rat Medicine and Other Unlikely Curatives. And, you know, that was pretty raw. It was a lot about, about booze and booze in my life and what it had done to me and what I'd seen it done, do to other people. Um, this is a different exercise. You know, I, I spend a lot of time in those church basements people talk about with other people trying to stay sober one day at a time. I was at Craig Ferguson said, uh, you know, I don't need to name it. But what at the front of the phone book is the way he put it. I like that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think when you have long-term sobriety, it's a little easy to begin to forget just how awful it was, towards the end especially. And so I think I wanted to go back and imagine what a day in my life might have looked like had I not stopped drinking 18 years ago. If I had taken that other road, where would I have ended up? And so this is really an imagining of, of that place. Can I say something completely ridiculous here? Sure. Okay. It's your show. Go for it. <laughs> but it's our conversation, <laughs> and I really don't want to offend you. No, it's okay. But, uh, you know, through the course of life and through the course of talking to people across this table, I've met people who have had problems with alcohol. Right. You, you don't seem like them. You, you well, seem, how do they seem? Well, this is the thing. Um, you seem different. You don't seem, and I've known you for a whopping 15 minutes here, well, right? Well, no, we're close. <laughs> you don't seem the type to have had a drinking problem. Well, I wonder what you think the type is. Well, that's what I'm getting at here. Yeah. What? yeah. You know, it's funny. As I say, I spend a lot of time in, in those church basements, right? And you would be amazed. I know. Well, you everybody would be tells me that. You amazed at the, at the people who are there well, and I've, the different kinds of people. Who I've are had there. a conversation with a former Ontario Attorney General across sure. this table. Sure. Who I have known for 15 years and never knew that he was an alcoholic. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's. Um, and I think, you know, if you problem, had clearly. met me in the first year or two or three of sobriety, you might not say that. Hmm. You might not say that. Because I think in those first few years, you know, what happens when you've been drinking alcoholically for a long time, and I drank alcoholically for 10 years, is a lot of the emotions that you ordinarily would have been feeling through those years, you drink away. You don't feel hmm. them. And so when you stop drinking, you know, that pot's boiling, and now you've taken the lid off, and boom, everything comes out. And there's, you, you can be quite unfocused. You can be quite oversensitive. You can, you can be bitter. You can be angry. I mean, all these things come up. And I think my poor long-suffering husband might tell you that I was not quite the joy you see sitting before you now Can't in those it. early years. Of Can't, impossible to believe. No, I don't think so. <laughs> the clever disguise is working, then. Sobriety works. How long it? has your long-suffering husband been your husband? We, um, we first got together in 1987. And I and we were married in 1990, and I was drunk, I would say, for the first eight years of our relationship. And so, you know, it was really wonderful when I got to eight years and a bit of sobriety, and now I had been sober with him longer than I had been drunk. That mm -hmm. really mattered to me, because one of the things that happened for me was you know, he said to me one day, we used to have, we, we talk a lot, and sometimes we'd be driving and we'd have these conversations about, so how are we doing? How's the relationship? How are you doing? How am I doing? And I said, so how are we doing? And there was this silence. 
And I thought, that, this is not good. The silence I'm hearing is not good. When did this happen? This was, I was still drinking. It was probably a year or so before I quit drinking. Okay. And he pulled over to the side of the road, and he started to tear up. And I thought, another woman? What's happening here? And he looked at me, and he said, I just don't think you're on my side anymore. And that, I mean, it still, bring, it still upsets me, because he was right. I wasn't on his side. I wasn't on my side either. Uh, but I wasn't on his side. And I wish I could tell you that I quit drinking that day, but I didn't. I didn't. I kept on drinking. Took another year. Yeah, took about another year. Yeah, took another year. And he's still your guy. He is still my guy. He's still my guy. And in fact, the dedication in that book is to him. Shall we look? Let's go for it. If it weren't for you, this wouldn't be fiction. That's right. That's a lovely dedication. That's right, and it's true. Okay, well, let's get into the pages of this book then some more. Why is it in Toronto? Well, I did a lot of drinking in Toronto. <laughs> I did some you're of very my... funny about. I gotta <laughs> say, you're very funny about talking about this thing well, that caused you so much agony. But anyway. you know, but I think <laughs> there is a certain absurdity to the lives of alcoholics as well. And I think part of the alcoholic makeup is, you know, we take ourselves so seriously. And there's, you know, at least when I was drinking alcoholically, if there wasn't enough drama in the world, I would create some because drama gave me an excuse to drink. And so there was a lot of you know, tragedy and drama. And I used to think, of course, that real writers, capital R, capital W, those writers, drank. Mm -hmm. You know, James Agee drank, F. Scott Fitzgerald drank, you know, Gene Rise. I mean, all of these people that I admired, they were drunks. And so therefore, if I wanted to do this properly, must be a connection. ergo, yeah. I, I must get drunk. And unfortunately, I think what happens with alcohol is it often sort of opens up a door of creativity, briefly. But it lies. To those of us who are alcoholics, probably not to you, but to those of us who are alcoholics, it lies. And so there's this wonderful line I heard once, and it said, alcohol gave me wings, and then it took away the sky. Hmm. And that's what it did for me in terms of my writing, is that, is that for a while, I thought I'd found it. You know, I was going to be that writer. And uh, the more I drank, the less I wrote. And then I'd write sort of these, what I thought were brilliant first paragraphs. And then when I read them over the next day, they were just drunk and blither. And probably for the last three years, I didn't write at all. Because you were? Drinking. Too much. I was drinking, yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it shuts down a lot of that. It shuts down what you think of as yourself. <laughs> but a lot of the drinking that I did took place here in Toronto. And it's funny because I, uh, I was married before. My husband is my last husband, he likes to call it. He thinks third sounds a bit unfriendly, <laughs> but he is my last husband. But I was married to a wonderful guy here in Toronto, uh, Glenn Olive. Shout out to Glenn Olive, bass player here in, in Toronto. And Glenn never drank. And so while we were together, I never drank. Hmm. And, and the night that largely my fault, the marriage broke up, um, I started drinking. You know, a girlfriend of mine said, are you okay? I said, no, not really. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go out and get drunk, which seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing for me to do, given that I reasonable thought my response marriage to was that kind of thing. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? So I go out and I get drunk. And I remember thinking that night, this is how crazy your thinking gets as an alcoholic. If I can just keep a bottle of vodka in the house, I bet I can keep this marriage together. <laughs> Right? It's insane, right? That's insane thinking. Well, okay, let me get you in a, in a similar headspace. I want you to help understand. There's a situation in the book. Colleen's given an ultimatum by her employer. Yes, she is. You're drunk. You either go out and get fixed on my dime or uh, I'm going to fire you. Right. And she, she chooses. She says something rather rude to him, doesn't she? <laughs> well, but bottom line, chooses to be happen. fired. Absolutely. Chooses to be fired Absolutely. rather than get fixed on somebody else's uh, dime. Fixed? What do you mean fixed? There's nothing wrong with her. Fixed. Okay, so that's the headspace I want to try to understand better. Fixed? You know, one of the overwhelming um, characteristics of the alcoholic is defiance. Mm -hmm. So it's not that she doesn't know she has a problem, but don't you dare tell her she has a problem. So she may know she has a problem, sure. but I don't want to hear it from you. Yeah. I used to say I was drinking for, against, my, against my own will for a very long time. So just like Colleen, she, Colleen gets up every morning, she wakes up, she's sick as a dog. She, you know, she, you know, I think it opens up with her wondering why she's chewing on socks, right? Because she feels like she's got dirty old mm -hmm. socks in her mouth. You know, she feels awful, she feels dreadful. She's filled with this anxiety. She doesn't quite know what she's done. She knows she's done something she shouldn't have done, but she's not quite sure what it is, right? And she says, today's my detox day. Hmm. 
All right, I'm not drinking today. Detox day. All right. And what's she doing by 11 o'clock? She's drinking. All right. Back at it. Right. Uh, another scene. Vodka in a salad dressing bottle. Absolutely. Yeah. You know how many people have read that and said, I wish I'd thought of that when I was drinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. Too many. But that's the, that is the, the length you will go to in order to oh, sure. sneak. Oh, sure. That's, and, you know, the, the, the novel, you know, some people have said is an autobiographical. There are some things in it that are based on things that happened to me. And although I never went to a temp agency with vodka in a salad bottle, what I did do is I went out for lunch one day with someone I knew didn't drink. And I think it was in a spice bottle that I had put booze. And I went down to the bathroom just to top up a little bit, and I dropped it. On the floor? On the floor. And yeah. it was a tile floor, and of course it shattered. Smashed. You know, so now not only you know, am I weaving slightly, but I'm reeking of vodka fumes. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, there's a little bit left in that. You know, I could maybe drink that. And, I, and I, even while that was happening, although that was years and years before I quit drinking, I remember thinking to myself, this is not good. I, you know, I don't, I don't ever remember as a child thinking, gee, when I grow up, I hope I'm standing in a public bathroom somewhere thinking, you know, considering sucking up vodka from a broken bottle on the floor. Mm -hmm. And so the, I put that scene in the, in the book. It's slightly different, but I put that idea in the book because that concept that that's how far you'd go, that that kind of insanity is even possible. That's a picture of desperation. It's a picture of desperation. And insanity. Alcoholism is very much a disease of perception. We don't see things the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, I know the questions have been personal so far, but if I'm going too far with personal questions, you let me know. Because I'm about to ask you about a comparison between the relationship of your lead character in here to her mother and yours with your mother. Right. Hers, in the book with her mother, she kind of inherits the, um, the will to drink. Do you know, did you? Yeah, she, you know, my, uh, my background is fairly complicated. I'm adopted, and I was adopted into a family where there is mental illness and alcoholism. And, but if uh, this is hereditary, you didn't get it that way then. No, but I did meet my birth family later on in life. Oh. And uh, so I thought, you know, here's, you know, other kids when they're adopted, they sort of go, oh, gee, I'm adopted, you know. And I look, I'm adopted. Um, <laughs> because there was this sort of genetic code in the family. Mm. When I met my birth father, um, he's an alcoholic. He's now been sober longer than I have. Both of my half-brothers died. They committed suicide as a result of alcoholism and drug addiction. So the entire question to me of whether this is a genetic disease or whether it's an environmental disease, kind of moot. You know, I think, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, why do you think you're an alcoholic? And of course, the easy answer to that is, I'm an alcoholic because I'm an alcoholic. I drink because I'm an alcoholic. That's why I drink. But there are, you know, there are some very clear reasons why some people are addicts and other people's aren't. Some of those are genetic. There's an enzyme in the liver that uh, my, en the enzymes in my liver, had you tested me pre-alcoholism, would still have been different. Than, than those, say, of my husband, who's, who has not, not an addictive bone in his body. So there certainly is a genetic component, and we see this with, with groups of people, uh, Native Americans, Irish people. My father is part Mohawk. My mother's Irish. I don't know why I ever thought I'd get away with this. Um, <laughs> so we see, we see that sort of genetic code. We see that it runs in families. But also there's a way of coping in the world. Uh, my adopted mother, uh, who had certain mental health problems, uh, you know, she, she, her, her, her belief that perhaps she was not always lovable, and that drama would create more attention, is something you, inhi you inherit gen um, environmentally. You know, mm. that's the way you learn to cope. So I think when you put those things together, it's fairly easy to see. But the real reason is, and there's a scene in there that really is quite autobiographical. When Colleen remembers at 14 when she had her first real drunk. And she's at this party. And she doesn't feel like she belongs. And all the cool kids are there. And she was able to tag along. But she's not really part of the group. Uh, and there are the pretty girls and the guys she likes. But none of them are really paying attention to her. And then somebody says, drink this. You know, and it's that Alice in Wonderland moment, right? Mm -hmm. Drink me. And she drinks it. And I remember being at that party. It was at Paul Wade's house. And uh, I had that drink. And 
I, to, this, to this moment, I remember what happened in my head. And we talk about the click, right? this click happened. And not only was I suddenly far better looking, far more intelligent, <laughs> heck of a lot funnier, but I got it. I understood. I had insights I'd never had before. I understood why you behaved the way you did, why she was talking the way she was talking. The world suddenly made sense to me in a way it had never made sense before. And the reason it, the book is called The Empty Room is we often talk about this, what they sometimes call the God-shaped hole or the empty room in the center of an alcoholic's heart. Hmm. And that was filled. And it's, you know, when my husband or other normal people have a drink, they may get giddy, they may get, you know, sort of social, a little uninhibited. I have a metaphysical transformation. It feels different to mm -hmm. me. And that is something I chased for decades. Do you miss that feeling at all? I don't because I, I think, like all peak experiences, they're not to be repeated. And I don't know, I don't know why I had that experience. Uh, I don't know why many alcoholics do. I don't know what it is. That's a mystery to me. But I do know that alcohol, as I said, lies. Right? I mean, I've always said if alcohol was still working for me, I'd still be drinking. But it didn't work for me after a while. And there were consequences. And my definition of what an alcoholic is is somebody who drinks in spite of the consequences. Hmm. Doesn't matter how much you drink or how often you drink. If, you, if you're having consequences from drinking and you're still drinking, you need to look at that. And you know, we always say, if you're drinking too much, drink less. If you can't drink less, don't drink. And if you can't not drink, you need, you need to get help. How long did it take you to figure out that you are not one of those people who can simply drink less? Oh, I knew that almost right off the bat. But it didn't matter. I wasn't going to do anything about it. Right. And that's the defiance. Hmm. Right? That's the defiance. Uh, these issues are actually pretty hot in terms of our culture nowadays. There yeah, are I some think very, are. I mean, the, your book is out there. Uh, we had uh, Jovita Bidlovska right. in here not too long ago. There are a number of television shows. I think uh, Nurse Jackie's one of them. Yeah, I love Nurse um, Jackie. Leaving what Las is, what Vegas. What did she say? Bitter and surly, these are my people. I get her totally. <laughs> And there's another book coming out in the fall, also by Harper Collins. And Dosset, is that her name? I'm going to get it wrong. She did a, she did a, a series for the Toronto Star on women. And Dosa Johnson. Yes, thank okay. you. She's coming out with what I understand is a very good book, a nonfiction book, uh, on women and alcohol in the fall. It's the year of the drunk women. What can I tell it's you? It's not a first-person book, I don't think, is it? No, no, it's nonfiction. Yeah. No, no, it's no. She's she's okay. she's. Because I know her a little bit. And I never. Yeah. No, no, no. But I, then no, again, no. I, as far as far as I know, as as she's not else. a member of my tribe. But yeah. Uh, do you do you think that fiction does a better job than fact at getting these issues out on the table in a way that makes people? Oh, I think it depends totally on the understand reader. Understand better. I think it depends totally on the reader. I mean, there are if you're if you're like me and stories tell truth to you. Then, 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 then you will like this book. If, if you want to be told a story about a character who hopefully you care about, if you want to turn the pages, if that's what works for you, absolutely. Some people are fact and fiction people, you know, fact, fact people. They want the facts, they want the numbers, that's what moves them. That's great. You know, there's something for, it's not a competition. Do you think it's, I mean, I, I, I assume that one of the reasons you wrote this book, but you can tell me, is that uh, obviously, you want people to read it because you're an author and you want people to read what you do, but you hope that for those for whom this is a problem, there are some lessons in, in there to be learned and maybe a different road to be taken. Is that right? Yeah, sure. I hope, I hope that somebody who reads this book who has a drinking problem will see that they're not alone. Because even though the facts in this book, you know, what happens to her, whether she goes to point A to point B, whether she talks to this person or that, that's completely subjective. But the way she feels, in those moments when she's alone and nobody's looking, I hope that's pretty universal. I, I, the alcoholics I know well, they feel this way. And so hopefully somebody who thinks that they're the only person who feels this way will recognize that they, that they aren't alone. But also I think the alcoholic is a very opaque personality because what they look like on the outside is very rarely what they feel like on the inside. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talk about alcoholics being tornadoes in the lives of, of the people around them. We take hostages, you know, and, and bad things happen around us. And I know that if you, if you are in a relationship with somebody who's an alcoholic, if you have a family member who's an alcoholic, 
if you're if you work with somebody, if your neighbor, I, I mean, there is so many people around. I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody who's who's dealing with this disease. Then perhaps this is also a door for the for the person who doesn't have this disease to 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 look behind the curtain a little bit and see what's happening there. But you know, the bottom line is it's a novel, and I hope I hope people will enjoy reading it for its own sake. What's the B for, Lauren B. Davis? Beverly. Beverly. And there's a Lauren Davis, and I'm going to give her a plug here. There's a Lauren Davis out of Chicago who writes children's books. Hmm. And, uh, and so in the hopes that we would not always be confused with each other, I threw the B in. There's no confusing you for any other <laughs> Lauren Davis, that's for sure. That's the fastest 25 minutes I think I've ever uh, experienced in my life. Yeah, <sighs> that, but that, was, that, that just went by so lickety split. You're a delight to talk oh, to. Oh, I love talking to you. What a pleasure to meet you. you. The Empty Room, a novel by Lauren Beverly Davis. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.